So good afternoon and welcome to the Observatorio de la Lengua Española y las Culturas Hispánicas en los Estados Unidos. Today's event is a very special one indeed for various reasons. First, we are back in a beautiful lecture room of this research center of the Instituto Fernández at Harvard University here on the Cambridge campus. And this lecture is the first we held in person for, for the last three years, ever since the pandemic started. Secondly, another reason why this event is very special for us is that this is in fact our first experience with a hybrid format. Since although we were really longing to be back here in this room and to see our speaker and our audience in person, we didn't really want to lose all the friends we've made through Zoom for the past two years. All those people who've been following our events, uh, thanks to, to Zoom online from various universities in the US, in, in, in Latin America, in Spain and other European countries. So let me greet the people who are watching us. Uh, I don't know what to look at. <laughs> are watching us via Zoom today. And let me ask you all, both those of you who are here and those of you who are on the, behind the screen, to bear with us if there are any technical hitches or if you if you see we're a bit clumsy like I'm being now uh, with the development of the event today. To celebrate this comeback, and I dare say inaugurate maybe a new period, we wanted to have a particularly relevant guest guest speaker. So we feel very fortunate and honored to, to have been able to invite Professor Richard Kagan. Uh, from Johns Hopkins University, whom I had in fact met uh, at the beginning of the pandemic in a panel we both shared, uh, and I invited him to, to give a presentation at the observatory, and he kindly accepted that when events could, could be back in the in-person uh, in in format. Little did we guess then that we would have to, to wait two years, two long years for that. Uh, but I'm so glad it is finally on this occasion that we can have Professor Kagan here with us. Lastly, we would like to dedicate this event to the memory of Professor Jonathan Brown, uh, the renowned historian of art, a uh, real expert in Spanish art, in particularly in the golden age, uh, who was a close friend and, and close colleague of Professor Kagan's and who sadly left us uh, at the beginning of this year. Spain will always be in debt to Professor Jonathan Brown for the careful, penetrating and, and innovative look he gave to Spanish art and for his important contribution to, to, to reappraising Spanish art on the international front. And Professor Kagan actually dedicated his book, Spanish Trains, to Jonathan Brown, so it was, so it was very fit, fitting to dedicate this talk to him too. Mm -hmm. Let me just briefly switch over to Spanish to para uh, agradecer al, al Dr. Felipe Pereda, catedrático de Spanish Arts en Fernando Fobel y Ayala en Harvard University, que haya aceptado mi invitación a presentar a su antiguo colega, el profesor Kagan, por quien me consta siente no solo una inmensa admiración, sino un profundo afecto. Así que le doy muchísimas gracias, Felipe. Les dejo con Felipe, quien después de la presentación de profesor Kagan dará paso a la, a, la, a la conferencia. Y luego tendremos un breve coloquio, tanto con ustedes como con los que están viéndonos por la pantalla, que podrán también hacer preguntas y las a través del chat y las proyectaremos en la, en la pantalla. Gracias. Thank you, Marta. Um, I'll be uh, brief. Uh... It is, uh, it is a pleasure, it is an honor to uh, introduce Professor Richard Kagan, admired colleague and very good friend for uh, many, many years now. Uh, it doesn't absolutely need an introduction, but uh, I will go over it briefly uh, for the sake of uh, those that uh, you're not so familiar with his, his immense uh, work. Professor Kagan is the author of Lovejoy, professor uh, of Emeritus of History and uh, Academy Professor of History at Johns Hopkins uh, University. And he's, of course, very well known, as I just said, for his so many contributions to the culture in the, in the broadest sense of the, of the word, uh, art, culture, and politics and history of Spain uh, and the global Hispanic world. Uh, and, you know, has so many books uh, 
but it is good sometimes to go over the list and see how much you have published, right? <laughs> Since uh, Urban Images of the Hispanic World, 1493, uh, published in the year 2000, Spain and America, The Origins of Hispanism in the United, United States, 2002, Clear on the Crown, The Politics of History, Medieval and Early Modern Spain, 2009. Currently, uh, Flor Kagan is um, working on a much expected book, uh, a biography of uh, Henry Charles uh, Lee, uh, who is one very particular aspect of Hispanism. It is a uh, historian and scientist from a Quaker uh, family who for 20 years uh, worked in somehow the earliest history of the Inquisition, right, uh, ever been uh, published in, uh, in, in, in English. Uh, a three volume, uh, fantastic work, a work, a history of the Inquisition of Spain, four volumes, 1906, 1907, in which he worked on uh, tons of documents uh, that he had copied from, uh, from, from Madrid and then been shipped or sent uh, to his office in, uh, in Philadelphia. This is a, a very little known, but uh, in, Fascinating and so important aspect of of uh, of um, of his work, uh, and I think again, I think we're all looking forward to that. Today, however, he will not be speaking about uh, that book uh, uh, or that project. Although I hope you will come back soon uh, okay. to talk about that. <laughs> but about uh, but he will be speaking about his latest book, which is this book that I have here in my hands. This big book, uh, but a fast reading, I have to say. It's a very it's a great it's a great read. Uh, already been translated into, into Spanish. Uh, the English original title, The Spanish Phrase, America's Fascination with the Hispanic World, 1779-1939, was published in 2019. And it is a book that traces the history, interest, enchantment, even passion, if I may say, uh, towards Spain and the Hispanic world uh, here in the, uh, in the Americas. Story that must be seen as the reverse, the flip side, um, of the development of the black legend uh, that was invented um, in the late 16th century and grew uh, to find its pitch in 1898 uh, at the time of the Spanish-American War. Professor Kagan's book, uh, which is, I was saying, a, a, an immense pleasure to read, uh, shows that not only rejection and disdain, uh, but also fascination, and not only hate, but also love, must be brought together to fully consider the ground on which Hispanism uh, was rooted uh, in this country for the last 100 years. So I think there's, uh, there's so much to learn here from uh, the origins of uh, this discipline and the point of which we are still uh, today. So uh, I also uh, would not want to finish before mentioning that I'm, I'm extremely delighted um, to see that this uh, lecture will be given in the memory of Jonathan Brown. Uh, there's few people who have done so much to give an impulse and, 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 and to, uh, to bridge the Americas with Spain and to promote the study of Spanish art uh, in the last maybe 100 years. Uh, I think he, his legacy is uh, so important uh, for who we are now. And we help, I hope that with the help of uh, people like Richard Gagan, we'll still uh, contribute to make this uh, even more uh, uh, present. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome, uh, happy welcome, uh, Roger Kagan. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Marta's staff, the observatorio. And thank you for coming. And those of you who are in cyberspace, thank you for listening. And, and I do want to thank Jonathan Brown in memoriam. In many ways, Jonathan put me up to the Spanish craze. I had given a lecture on collecting of Spanish art in the United States. And I was discussing with Jonathan. I said, well, should I do something bigger, a bit more ambitious? And he's with this rather laconic style. He said, Richard, go for it. <laughs> Little did I know that go for it cost me 10 years of my life, but that's, but that's OK. But thank you, Jonathan. I know you're listening someplace. Now, um, I have to get, I have to do a little juggling here. Uh, and I will go to the first slide. I don't know how many of you saw or at least listened to the Metropolitan Opera's recent performance of Verdi's Don Carlos, the ill fated son of the 16th century Spanish monarch Philip II. It's libretto, loosely based on a play by the 18th century German playwright Frederick Schiller. 
And an even older study of Don Carlos by the uh, French scholar, the Abbe de Saint Real, and, and ultimately an account crafted in 16, 1564 by another French writer, Pierre de Bourguer, Seigneur de Banton. All of those three represent Philip as a truly malevolent monarch responsible for the double murder of his young wife, Isabel de Valois, and his son, Don Carlos, his son by another marriage. Uh, you know, he was roughly the same age as, as Isabel. Yeah, Philip suspected Carlos of having, the two were having a love affair behind their back, his back, that's the story. Well, this wholly a negative image of Philip II, integral to what is Philip Felipe just mentioned it, the so called black legend that's darkened Spain's history so, for so many years, is one that many recent historians, including my good friend Jeffrey Parker, has attempted, have attempted to revise. Even so, the image of Philip as a bloodthirsty tyrant survives. And so too does the black legend, a term coined by Amelia Parker Bathan in the talk given in Paris in 1899, and later popularized by a Spanish bureaucrat turned historian, Julian Juderias, to refer to the ways in which foreigners, Protestants mostly, painted an image of Spain that was entirely evil and dark. The question of who invented the black legend remains a matter for, for debate, although credit generally goes to Fray Bartolome de las Casas and his 16th century count of Spanish cruelties in the Americas. But independently of, independently of its source, I've been recently struck by the number of books published in Spanish uh, and, and de devoted to that particular subject. And here's just a few of them. Is that the whole screen? Yeah. Uh, oh, there's people on the, you mean when put whole screen? Yeah. Uh, and, and there's three, Empiriophobia, by, by, and this is a best-selling book by Alvira Roca, uh, Un Rato de Grande Florodorio by Ferrella Ortega, who, uh, who offer, he offers a kind of double vision of Spain, an indolent, decadent Spain on the one hand, versus one that is militantly imperialistic. And more recently, Madre Patria by an Argentinian political scientist who argues that the black legend continues to darken Spain images, many Spain's many positive image contributions to world history. Well, this apparent fixation on the black legend has several possible explanations, mostly internal to Spain, and it's locked again, mostly internal to Spain itself, as Jesus Villanueva uh, has convincingly argued, and one that relates directly to the efforts of various conservative parties in Spain, the Partido Popular, and more recently Vox, to rally support for their particular brand of Spanish nationalism. And from, that, from their perspective, Spain was never so bad, nor ever so evil as its, as its detractors, mainly Protestant, and in some cases now Catalan, maintain. As Villanueva so simply put it, the black legend is back. This Spanish preoccupation with the, or well, Spanish-Spanish preoccupation with the black legend contrasts with the manner in which many non-Spanish non historians in recent years have approached Spain in its history. Adopting a comparative approach to the subject, and let's hope I'm unlocked, books such as Eliot's Empires of the Atlantic World, another giant we've recently lost, rereading the Black Legend from 2007, Gabriel Paquette's recent European seaborne empires. These books have done much to eradicate the idea of Spanish exceptionalism, whether with respect to its treatment uh, of racial and religious minorities within the metropolis, let alone various indigenous peoples overseas. At the same time, other studies focused on Spain's presence in North America have attempted to do the same. And here I'm thinking of a whole series of works. Here's, here's, here's three of them, all of which were attempted to document Spain's multifaceted imprint upon the cultural and social history of the United States. I'm also thinking of some recent monographs which have drawn new, new attention to the Spanish contribution to the war, to America's War of Independence against Great Britain. I'm thinking of Stephen Hackle's edited collection of essays devoted to Junipero Serra and the Franciscan missions in, in California, which offers, offers a, an even-handed approach to this somewhat controversial topic. 
balancing the, be the benefits as well as the defect defects of the missions and their treatments of, and treatment of California's natives. In sense, they're, they're like Ulysses trying to navigate the Straits of Messina. Uh, the, these and other books avoid on the one hand the, the Scylla of the black legend and on the other the Charybdis of the white legend. And in a sense, they're attempting to represent the deeds of the, Sp of the Spaniards in America. And they're not trying to you know, either condemn or, 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 or applaud. They're trying to do something in, in the middle. That's a, of a, a balance. And in a sense, what happened? And, and not judging them in a critical, necessarily wholly critical, or let's say presentist way. I see something of the same in Andre Reisens's book, The Other Slavery, which is quite a, quite a remarkable study, focus on the enslavement of native, native peoples of North America, enslaved by Spaniards and their Creole descendants, by British and American colonists, but also enslaved among the native peoples themselves. For example, Comanche enslavement of, of the Pueblos. Once again, the aim of these works is neither to, to, to condemn nor whitewash, the harsh treatments of, of natives by, by the colonists, but simply to explain. And I think that too is the message, whoops, in, 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 South, in, in Alice Baumgartner's South to Freedom, which documents the extent to which black, sa black slaves in Texas and other parts of the South fled to Mexico in order to take advantage of a judicial system that is based in part upon, this, part upon the Spanish medieval code, the Siete Partidas, a code that enabled slaves, gave slaves the possibility of emancipation, at least at the death of their, of their owners. And to be sure, Spain, Mexico for these runaways was no paradise. And even after their freedom, they continued to work like slaves and remain subject to discrimination. But juridically, at least, they were free. And that's an important distinction. In the same vein, I think my book, The Spanish Craze, offers an alternative to those who would indelibly link foreign perceptions of Spain with the Black legend. The book is organized around the opening decades of the 20th century, a moment during which the traditional image of Spain as a cruel backward nation shift, shifted to one that was much more positive and to be respected for the importance of its culture together with the authenticity and strength of its national character. Now it's difficult, it's difficult to fix the precise moment that this change in opinion occurred. And as, and, and as I will explain, there are indications that began the Spanish and American War of 1898, but the change in question gained momentum after the war. Oops, sideways. <laughs> 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 Can't do anything. But when, as this image, turn your head. As this image says, the, na the nation's mood was forgive and forget, and that 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 now we can do. And that and, and President Taft verbalized that mood of forgive and forget when, in an address offered in Washington D.C. in 1908, he defended Spain's record in both America and the Philippines. And just a year later. In, 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 in another gesture towards Spain, he invited Joaquin Sorolla, it's right here, mm -hmm. uh, to the White House and commissioned him to paint his official presidential portrait. I don't believe there was a presidential portrait before Tab painted by a foreign artist. It's quite an achievement. Mm -hmm. Forget, forgive and forget was also in the mood in 1914 when the, uh, when the former president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, a veteran of the 1998 war traveled to Madrid, met with King Alfonso XIII, visited various museums, including the Prado, and called attention to the universal importance of Spain's language and culture. This is from a former guy who in the 1880s had much, not much love for Spaniards. He changed his mind. As for the craze itself, it manifested itself in different ways. Starting around 1890, for example, it appears in the rarefied world of art collecting across the river in Boston with Isabella Stewart Gardner, as well as in New York with the, in the guise of Henry Clay Frick. Isabella Stewart and two of her, her, her first acquisition was that Zubaran, which is now hanging in the, in the Spanish chapel to the, to the right, of, as you go to the right, as you, as you enter in, or her prize, uh, Zuber, her, her prize Zuberan, a student of 
Salamanca, which is a magnificent portrait, as anyone can test. See, so this is a little some sloppiness here in my, my PowerPoint. I don't know what happened here. Or, and then, oh, oh, where's Henry Clay Frick? There's Henry Clay Frick. Some, somehow the, this has gotten mixed up. Uh, who, who also was a, 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 a prized his Velasquez. You can see that there on the right, and excuse me, on the left and his El Greco on the right in this posthumous portrait. You also see it in the collecting habits of two New York collectors, Eloise and, uh, 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 Eloise and Henry Havermeyer. And, the, and as I don't say it in the book, but elsewhere, they were two, two, two collectors who fell prey to a particular disease that was called El Greco -philitis. It affected many American collectors in the early parts of the 20th century. There was Moneitis, there was Senitis, but there was also El, Gre El Greco Philitis, which is a, 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 a wonderful but difficult to pronounce term. And you also find it in the collecting of, uh, of Charles Deering, a wealthy Chicago, you can think of uh, John Deering and Sons. He built his own little castle in Spain on the coast uh, in, in, in Sitges. And he collected a raft of, of, of Spanish pictures, including this wonderful 15th century, uh, St. George slaying the dragon by Mar Martorell. In a sense, the, this interest in these kinds of paintings, is totally new. In the only part of the 19th century, Murillo was in vogue, both in Britain and in the United States, but no one had collected anything in the way of Spanish art. And in fact, most critics said, there's not much of interest in that in that school of art. It's without poetic inspiration or imagination. Well, this, but this craze for Spain was not limited to the rarefied world of art collectors. It could be also be found in music. With new interest, and in, in, you have a you have a, 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 a publication on this. I'd be interested to see it, Marta. With new interest in compositions by such Spanish composers as the Falla, Granados, Valverde, and which together marked what a leading New York critic labeled the Spanish blaze, a blaze that continued to burn right through the decade of the 1920s. And much the same happened in literature with the so-called Dean of American Letters, William Dean Howells, calling fiction by such contemporary Spanish writers as Palacio Valdez, Perez Galdós, Pardo Batán, and especially Blasco Ibáñez. And there's a little bit more um, music <laughs> uh, in a little Spanish town. And, and I, I didn't bring the, the verses, but The Wonderful Kid from Madrid by Al Jolson. It's, it, it's, it's a ridiculous song, <laughs> but, but it's part of the, this Spanish plays I've been talking about. And, and, and Howells especially like Blasco Ibanez, and he said, There's, he's the best there is, the, the best writer there is in, right now in the world. And there was also a, a renewed interest just about the time of World War I with Spanish languages, matriculations in Spanish languages in high schools, colleges, and universities across the country skyrocketed. In fact, becoming so popular that other foreign language instructors argued that it ought to be stopped. That, that didn't happen. And, that, and the same taste for Spain also appeared on Hollywood's silver screen in the guise of a whole series of pictures of kind of unromanticized Spanish subjects, many of which like Ramona or Loves of Carmen or Rosita, were, 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 were projected in atmospheric cin cinematic palaces with names such as the Alhambra, Granada, or Sevilla. Now, these films also, same time, talking about the mid 20s, triggered new interest in Spanish fashion. I love this, this, I think, I've never seen it in the flesh, but it's in the private collection. But this picture by J.C. Leidendecker, a woman with a manton de mania, is the technical term. Uh, there was a, a vogue for Spanish fashion throughout the 1920s when this the so called manton Maria was the fashion accessory. If you, if you didn't have a manton, the mania, you were nobody. <laughs> Boston, New York, Baltimore, Washington, or, or, or wherever. And, you, and, if, and, and, and more than that, there you see Mrs. Randolph Hearst, Mrs. Alice B. Garrett, 
a, a New Yorker or a Zuluaga's wonderful portrait of her in 1923 and, and his portrait of, of Alice Garrett done in, 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 actually I think it was done in Paris, but she was a, a Baltimore uh, debutante and, 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 and an important socialite at that particular time. And they're also wearing the pignettes. And, if you, and, and in addition to Spanish dress, you should have Spanish powder and Spanish cigarettes as, as well. And, it's, it's, and there's other accessories I don't want to show you pictures of because I could get, it, get into trouble. And, that's, that, and, and it's that same decade, the 20, that, that marks a particular interest in Spanish in Spanish themed architecture. In truth, that interest began in the 1880s with the construction of Spanish styled and themed hotels in, in, in Floridian cities such as, such as St. Augustine. And here we have really the first great Spanish hotel in America, the Ponce de Leon, which is now a, a, the home of a, a college in, in St. In, in Saint Augustine. And if you go inside uh, the Ponce de Leon, you'll enter what is, used to be the dining room. It's festooned with a whole series of the, of the, uh, of the shields and, and, and symbols of a, a raft of Spanish cities. And here we can see, I hope you can see it. There's Cordoba and the other one is, is Sevilla uh, at the top. And, and then in the years that after, the, they, Ponce de Leon proved such a success that other builders want to Hispanicize what happened really, despite its Spanish origins, an English city or an American city in the mid 19th century, they want to Hispanicize it, built Spanish, Spanish themed hotels and changed the name of the streets from English names to Spanish names, Granada Street, Sevilla Street and the like. So in the sense it's becoming Hispanized because it, that's what the tourists wanted to, to see. It, it, the origins, it, if it starts in, in, in San Augustine and with the, Ponce de Leon, it quickly spreads to New York with the construction of the first American Giralda by Stanford White, which is modeled after the, the famous minaret, uh, come church tower in, in Seville. And, the, and the, that style suit proved so popular that it spreads across the United States, other places in New York to Chicago, Florida, uh, 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 San Francisco, as well as uh, as well as the last one really to be built was the one in Kansas City in Country Club Plaza, which dates to about 1934 to 1936. In a sense, it's, it, 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 it goes across the country. But there's other manifestations of the same interest in Spanish architecture in California, for example. The Growing interest in 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 the in the, in the, in the, in the old Franciscan missions becomes this, a kind of a simple whitewashed whitewashed stucco or, or adobe uh, so it's called mission style of architecture you can see here in an example from Riverside California but then. They add in some, they strip in some Baroque elements to borrow from Mexico and, for, and, and as well as Turgidesque architecture from Spain. And that becomes what's called Spanish revival architecture, here demonstrated in the California State Building designed by Grosvenor Goodhue, a Boston from New York architecture, had nothing in his background to do with Spain. He just falls in love with the style and starts building it in, in, in California and, El, and, and elsewhere. And elsewhere, and it's, and then it, it spreads across the country to churches such as this one in in, in Santa Fe, the Shrine Temple, which is oddly modeled after the uh, kind of the Alhambra, kind of a Lambresque building. And if you go inside of it, which very few tourists ever do, you will see a kind of a, 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 a curtain, and which are painted the, the rendition of of, of Granada to the to, to uh, the Moors, I mean, the Muslims surrendering Granada to the to the Christians. In 1492, you can see it in the universities, such as such as in in, in, in Lubbock, Texas, where uh, 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 the Bain administration building was modeled after the facade of the of the University of Alcala, which dates from the 1530s. You can see it in the middle, in the heart of the country, in Arkansas. In the, in the Edgman's house is a quintessential Spanish style house with whitewashed walls and red tiled roofs. And you can see it in the Spanish cottage, so, as it's called in New York, in the Plaza del Lago, a shopping center just outside of, of, of Washington, CC, or a Spanish revival house in Baltimore, you probably saw more than once, Felipe, when you lived there. There's whole cities built around the Spanish themes, as in Coral Gables. 
buy your Spanish house, your little Spanish castle. It's marketed to the to America's middle class as well. And, 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 and kind of kit houses marketed by Sears Roebuck, as well as in kind of developments along this, in, in, in Long Island, the shores of Seville. I mean, if you, if you go to the north coast, but in Long Island, you don't see much, very much in the way of Seville. But it, it all, all this notion of Spain conjures up ideas of luxury, comfort, relaxation. The South, in the sense, it's, 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 it's your little Spanish castle. It, it finds it difficult to get a toehold in rather stodgy New England. And I've been only been able to, there's a Spanish house in, in Hartford, Connecticut. I found two here right in the outskirts. I don't know if any of you, I've never seen them <laughs> in person. One is a mission style house in South Brookline, which you see on the left. And then the Spanish Revival House in Newton, which was modeled after one of its, one, one that its owners saw in life in Santa Monica, California. Right? Does anybody know these houses? And they should be, actually, I bet they were originally painted white, but they're no longer painted. Put, put, put simply, by the 1920s, Spain was in. Its hour had struck. But the question is, why Spain? Traditionally a country and a culture that the United States and its Protestant elites had held at arm's length. Why did the craze for things Spanish happen when it did? And what factors contributed to this largely unheralded and often forgotten chapter in the nation's history? The simple answer is that the negative image of Spain, that of the black legend, never enjoyed a total or permanent monopoly over the manner in which Americans saw Spain or viewed Spain. To be sure, Negative images is inherited from Protestant New England and numerous Enlightenment critics, such as Voltaire, who never ensured supply. But they regularly competed with other, other, view, other quite different views of the country, such as those celebrating the, the bravery and resistance of the Spanish people to Napoleon, Napoleon's brutal invasion of that country in 1808. Rallies were held around, around the country, including in Boston, across the a river supporting the, uh, supporting the efforts of the Spaniards to defeat the, 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 the invasion of a brutal, what was market or said to be a brutal imperialist dictator, in the sense of very similar to the way, the way you see uh, uh, Americans rallying to the cause of the Ukrainians today. That view of Spain, that heroic Spain, temporarily faded as Americans circa 1820 toasted the struggle of revolutionaries in Central and South America to break free of the tyranny of Spain. Yet starting already in the 1830s, that wheel turned once again here in Boston, when the famed historian William Prescott emphasized the extent to which Spain manifested itself in grand and heroic enterprise, such as the conquest of Granada, with his discovery of the New World, followed by the con and the discovery of the New World, followed by the conquests of Mexico and Peru. Now, Prescott envisioned Spain as a kind of organic ent entity that originated in the era of the Visigoths, the people who he credited with bringing to that country the laws, various laws and institutions, and, and also endowed it with a lasting spirit of liberty together with the energy and vitality that later translated into heroic undertakings on the scale of the reconquest of the, of, 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 of the peninsula uh, 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 from the Muslims, followed by ex expansion overseas. Now Prescott understood that these forces, once combined with monarchical authoritarianism and what he called religious enthusiasm, had their dark side. And, and especially in kind of incarnated, or it's an incarnation for him were the bigoted policies of Philip II. And it, says it mushroomed, the, the dark side of it, mushroomed under Philip, under, 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 under Philip II. But very few readers read his Philip II. In fact, it was an unfinished work. They paid much more attention to the, to the great deeds, or as he, as he re represented the, the great deeds of Cortes and Pizarro together with the efforts of Spaniards in the course of the 16th century 
to bring what he called civilization to the native peoples of the new world. Beyond that, Prescott's image of Spain, I call it sturdy Spain, that means that's heroic Spain, in the sense of a strong, robust people, created a model for other historians, particularly those interested in those parts of the country that could claim at least the Spanish past. Historians here in New England, Bancroft, Parkman, for example, were happy to trace the, the country's origins to the Mayflower and to the Puritans. But these historians, I mean, you don't hear very much of them, Thomas Buckingham Smith and George Fairbanks in Florida, for example, LeBaron Twins for New Mexico, uh, Fred Blackmar, a professor of Kansas uh, at the University of Kansas with interest in, in the Southwest and, and like Joyce Chaplin there, a PhD from Johns Hopkins and back in the uh, 1980s. They look back instead to, the, to, the, to settlements such as St. Saint, Saint Augustine in Florida, San Antonio in Texas, Santa Fe and New Mexico linking the history of these regions to Spain, partly for, and, and, and since they saw, they forgot about the Mexican aspect of it. They said, this was Spanish and they inherited the Spanish. And since that's where the true origins of, of those parts of the country lie. That linkage in many ways was more imagined than real, but it, and it, as it conveniently ignored the contributions of native peoples, and as I just said, together with those of, of, of mestizo origins, but it took, it took, it stuck. And here it's important to note that that image of Spain, sturdy Spain, as a kind of one of the major building blocks or one of the major foundations of the United States also found its way into the very symbolic heart of the country, the rotunda of the new capital under construction in Washington, D.C. Now, starting in the 1830s, as many of you know, Congress commissioned a series of monumental, historic, monumental paintings designed to illustrate key moments in the nation's history, among them the, embark the embarkation of the pilgrims, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, et cetera. Yet that same space, that same space also included paintings illustrating Spain's contribution to that same history, starting with the landing of Columbus by John Vanderlyn, hung there in 18, was, I, guess, I can't remember, hung there in 1847, and this one by William Powell, celebrating the uh, discovery of the Mississippi by De Soto, hung there in 1855. And these paintings, you know, here they are, alongside De Soto, Columbus, maybe we can understand, the bronze doors were there since the 1830s. Soto was kind of like, not particularly safe for carrying. <laughs> there they are complementing part of the history of the United States. And these paintings were, were then complemented in the 1870s above them with the installation of a bas relief frieze celebrating the nation's history, the nation's long history, with, with key moments illustrated, such as William Penn's peace treaty with the Lapi Indians, signed in Philadelphia the colonization of New England, together with others celebrating Pizarro's arrival in Peru, Cortez in Mexico, the burial of de Soto, all intended to illustrate different expressions of what Prescott had labeled the noble spirit of Spanish enterprise. Now, by the time Bermudez's freeze was installed, recognition of that noble spirit of enterprise, together with the idea of Spain's history that, that was the, in a sense, there was a linkage being created that Spain's history and that of the, the United States were essentially one. They were linked. And it drew new attention to the so called Spanishness of America's past. Consider, for example, this character Walt, Mitt, Walt, Walt Wilkman and his address delivered uh, in, in absentia, but delivered nevertheless at Santa Fe, New Mexico. At a, at, a, at a festival celebrating the territory's Spanish past. Forget the native, forget the Mexican. The, the poet then residing in Camden, New Jersey, was too old to attend, but sent a letter that was read aloud to the assembled crowd. And, and Whitman had long dreamed, of course, about a United States comprised of diverse ethnic groups. And on this occasion, he informed the public that it was wrong to think of our US, as he put it, solely in terms of our British heritage. It was also necessary to think about what he called the Spanish element in our nationality, an element, as he put it, 
that merited respect owing to its religiosity, loyalty, patriotism, valor, seriousness, and honor. Now, 1883, such thoughts are somewhat out of the ordinary for an era during which many in the US felt threatened by the masses of immigrants arriving from both Asia and Western and Southern Europe, as well as one in, an, in the middle of an age of race thinking that placed the Anglo-Saxon and Teutonic races on a much higher scale of achievement than the Latin ones. Yet Whitman was far from alone in drawing attention to America's Spanish element and that element's contribution to American culture. There's others such as Helen Hank, Helen Hank Jackson. She did the same in her best-selling novel, Ramona, which offered a somewhat, somewhat totally utopian vision of Spanish missions in California. And another who thought about Spat, that Spanish element in the same way was Charles Loomis, the so-called apostle of the Southwest, whose many books, in addition to remind, reminding readers that the Spanish treatment of the natives was far less cruel than that of the British, also aimed at instructing the public about the, their, Spain's various contributions to the country's history. He said, without the Spaniards, there's no Los Angeles. Without the Spaniards, there's no San Francisco. Without the Spaniards, there's no Santa Fe. There's no Florida. And he's a guy from New England. <laughs> Spent a lot of time in Cincinnati. <laughs> Goes out there, you get totally converted. Interesting change about it. Now, these ideas quickly took root, especially in the South and West, sparking a, a succession. Uh, there's, excuse me, there's, there's, there's Loomis. He liked, by the way, quarter war that was woven in, in, uh, in, in Barcelona. And it was supplied to him by the Spanish consul in San Francisco. Why in Los Angeles you would want heavy corduroy, which is be better fitted for climates such as Boston than Los Angeles, I don't know. Maybe he liked to sweat a lot. But you have a whole series of, 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 of Spanish themed festivals celebrating America's Spanish past. The idea is totally overwrought. It forgets, of course, the Mexicanness of California, let alone the Southwest, but it fostered, it, it fostered the idea that Spanish culture, one might say Hispanic culture, was not foreign, not an import, but rather autochthonous, homegrown, intrinsically American. And I think that idea, starting in the 1890s, helps to explain the popularity of all of these things I was talking about in, in the cultural sphere, as well as the idea, uh, uh, as well as the spread of Spanish style architecture across the idea that it, Spanish architecture wasn't a foreign architecture. It was an American, it was a quintessentially American idea, with some arguing that the, the Congress should designate Spanish revival architecture as the country's official national style. Nation. And that perhaps. Now, I don't want to exaggerate. Mm -hmm. There was resistance to that proposal. The black legend never totally disappeared, particularly in the run up to the war of 1898, as you can see in this uh, 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 propagandistic article from the, from, from the Chicago tri tri Tribune. But much of that, much of that kind of dark image was tempered by another more positive image of Spain. It's a kind of romantic paradox, what I call in the book, Sunny Spain. An image of the country of this kind, Washington Irving and his bestseller, Tales of the Alhambra, did so much to create. Now, prior to Irving, was, you can't exaggerate it, Spain image, Spain's image in the United States, as in Great Britain, was steeped in the black legend. It was a dark and somber nation supposedly weakened by ignorant priests, malevolent inquisitors, tyrannical kings. Just read John Adams's diary as he crossed Northern Spain. He'll tell you what a, what a wreck it was, thanks to the, the number of priests and convents and churches that he saw. They were sack sucking the nation's wealth and putting into what he saw useless, useless investments. In contrast, Irving Spain was blindingly sunny. 
brimming with adventure, and more importantly, relentlessly picturesque. People by dashing toreros, well, I'll go, go back for a second. Torero, let me go back. Did too soon. This is to, dashing toreros, and peasants garbed in traditional dress, brigands who did not rob but told stories, and gypsies who did nothing but dance and sing. And owing to the larger the importance of Irving, only, only larger the importance that uh, uh, Irving accorded to Yolanda and other Muslim monuments, Spain also becomes a kind of a, an exotic, quasi oriental country as well. It has, it has charms that no other place in Europe, let alone in the Mediterranean, can offer. Now, southern Spain, I shouldn't say he did it all by him himself, but sunny Spain offered the possibilities for visitors to travel backwards in time and return to the Middle Ages and to a land or to an era that was free of the smoke and the soot of the growing industrialized world. And I said Irving, Irving was no, but not the only person to craft that image of sunny Spain. I want to think of another local who, who helped in this regard. He taught, uh, he taught Spanish and uh, literature for a time. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow fellow in this wonderful images of him on Spain, riding from in, on horseback and riding from Malaga to Granada in 1827. And, there, and Irving also received help from, from French writers such as Théophile Gautier and Prosper Merrimé. But his image of Spain as a quasi-exotic country, a, a kind of an accessible orient, proved irresistible for artists, initially David Roberts, Scotsman, Later for Samuel Coleman, who was a New York plein air painter who went to Spain in the 1860s and fell in love with and painted all series of pictures such as the ones you see here, or America Socks and Thomas Aikens. And famously, sorry, I, I changed my wife's <laughs> to, to, from black to red, but you couldn't. <laughs> I didn't do it at all. Uh, uh, famously, uh, Ella Faleo was uh, 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 painted by a singer sergeant in Paris in, 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 in 1882. The same image also appears of, of sunny Spain, appears in William Merrick Chase's uh, Sunny Spain of 1882, same years. Sergeant, it shows up and travels in sunny Spain in the lectures, the illustrated lectures of John Stoddard, who lectured, traveled across the country, delivering to, to audiences a kind of a, this totally romanticized picture of Spain. It shows up that same image. Well, here's some of the kind of the, uh, the in, in periodicals you find illustrations of this kind of relaxed, sleepy country, but also picturesque, <laughs> cute little beggar boys in the streets, lovers with playing guitars. You see it in books such as these. Uh, Susan Hales travels across Spain, land of the castanets, uh, through, through Spain by donkey, <laughs> donkey back, go on, but travel across the country by bicycle, three vassal girls abroad in Spain. There's, there's dozens of these books. They've, been, they've never been really totally studied. They're, they're, they're look alike, but in a sense, there's a demand for these books. Publishers are churning them out one after another. In a sense, this is the land you're gonna you go to Spain. You'll see scenes straight out of the Middle Ages if you go there. This is something that Americans wanted, or at least those who could afford it, want to experience firsthand, and if they could, not, they could not do so, they bought books such as these. Now that image of Spain, of course, was a, was, was a, was a stereotype, but stereotypes sold and sold well, serving to generate new interest in Spain and, 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 and persuading those, I've just said it, I'm repeating myself here, persuading those who could afford to travel to Europe to alter their tradition, their, their, their itineraries, to include Spain and in travel and Irving's footsteps to the Andalusia. And they did, like, you, you can measure their arrival, and start, they, they grew by the hundreds, to the, almost the thousands in the 1880s. They were all went for the same reasons. They were in search of that old Spain, an eternal Spain, a romantic Spain, a, a Spain seemingly untouched by industrialization. And therefore, from, from their perspective, authentic, honest, 
and original in ways that their, their own country was not. These, of course, were many of the same qualities that Henry Adams found in the Middle Ages. And it was that same era in Spain history that Harvard's George Tickner, the nation's first great Hispanista, associated with the, that nation's the finest, most authentically Spanish literature for, for Tickner. The gold, true golden age was not the 16th and 17th century. He found it in the Romantics of the late Middle Ages. But that, it was the spirit of, this, of the spirit that them, those Romantics then represented the authentic democratic, authentic character of Spain, more so than anything that was produced in later centuries. And it was much the same for this Wellesley New Yorker by the name of Archer Milton Huntington, who first visited the country in 1892, went in search of Elfite, and he discovered the country's same unspoiled character, lo costito, as you say in Spanish, and its so-called amazing peasants. He also, Huntington also found it among the humble street porters he encountered on Madrid's Calle de Toledo in, in the heart of the old city. And he sought to capture and preserve that Spain in, in objects that he gathered and displayed in the Hispanic Society of America, founded in 1906, and later in the scenes of Spain, he commissioned Soroya to paint. And if you go walk around those paintings of the Hispanic Society of America, look for smoke, you won't find it. Look for a factory, a train, a car, not to be found. It's a Spain that had disappeared for the most part by the time Sir Roy painted it, but it's the one that Huntington convinced him to capture and to, re and to represent. And it's that same Spain, Lo, Lo Castifo, that enchanted Gertrude Stein when she first, first visited the country in 1899. It was that same Spain that enchanted Dos Pasos, who he, he found there what he called the earth feeling the, uh, kind of in the sense of deep roots that he believed the United States had lost, but Spain had miraculously been able to preserve because it had failed to modernize, it had failed to industrialize. And it was that same Spain that attracted Hemingway, but in this case, cheap brandy and good trout fishing and the bull ring, the place where he could test his own manhood also helped. <clears throat> now, such in brief are some of the ingredients that helped to explain the craze for Spain. And in truth, I find it difficult to assess which ones were the most important. But blended together, the craze ensued. But crazes, by definition, by definition, are ephemeral. They come and they go. They wax and they wane. And so it was with the Spanish craze. It lasted longer than most, several decades, in fact. But starting around 1930, it too ran out of steam for reasons, various reasons, there's the spot connected uh, to the growth of Pan-Americanism in the United States, uh, late 19th, early 20th century movement, when America tried to see its common roots with the cultures, uh, uh, with the countries of Latin America. And it disappeared partly owing to the, to the, to the arrival of Roosevelt's good neighbor, neighbor po policy that shifted the country's foreign policy more and more in the direction of South America. And, and that good neighborhood policy helped to ignite across the country growing interest in, the, in, in Latin American music. Think, do I have a slide? Carmen Miranda, for example. It's Latin American cuisine from tacos from Mexico. But the coup de grace came from Spain, Spain itself uh, and with the troubled tumultuous history of the Second Republic, the agonies of the Civil War, Franco's victory. The latter in particular served to drive a wedge between Spain and the United States. It also breathed new life into the black legend. And like the great mythical Phoenix, the black legend had been practically moribund, almost forgotten during the years of the Spanish craze, but owing mainly to Franco and the onset of his fascist regime, that, that, that Phoenix gained new strength and started to fly once again. And in the US and elsewhere, it helps to explain what, uh, what we, we, we get to understand the Spanish exceptionalism, why Spain was different. Why, that, why had that country failed to, to join the long march of Western civilization towards democracy? 
Franco understood Spain was different. Americans accepted that. And if you, you know, I, I can go on and on how I was taught the history of Western civilization and Spain dropped out of it somewhere after 1588. <laughs> for this reason, it was easy for Harvard and other universities to stop teaching the country's history, or at least restrict it to language departments, where together with instruction in, in Spanish, it was taught in isolation. My own university, Columbia, an undergraduate, it disappeared. Well, here, when when I'm, uh, I'm excuse me, I'm showing my age, <laughs> but but when the uh, what's his name, the history of the Spanish Empire in the Middle Ages, when he when he retired in 1946 or 1943, uh, I'll think of his name in two seconds. Never replaced, never replaced. Spain was out by the 1950s, and meanwhile. The black legend acquired new legitimacy. And as Jesus Villanueva explained, Franco and his cronies could use that idea to, dispense, to, to defend their idea of Spain, saying and, and, against its detractors in the United States and elsewhere. I will finish now. Such as legends, such as legends, like fashions, they fewer fix, they come and they go. They flourish under circumstances, circumstances and fade under others. And for the reasons they should not be studied in isolation without reference to a specific contest, context or, 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 or surroundings. And that's something I tried to do in the Spanish craze, the end of which I tried to show following the end of the Frank regime and the restoration of Spanish democracy in 19, 1978, the, import, the importance of the black legend faded away as the country recuperated much of the luster enjoyed during the time of the craze itself. Absent in the US edition, when you have Felipe, but present in the Spanish edition, I added a postscript. I added a postscript, which I, uh, which I, in which I addressed what I perceived was an, an error committed by various Spanish observers when they linked the, night, the 2020 furor, furor surrounding the statues of Columbus and Juan de Ñate and Junipero Serra to the black legend to but they saw as growing anti-Spanishness in the US. In my view, that was far too, and far too nationalistic, perhaps even a paranoid to response to what was going on in the United States. A, re a reading uh, that probably one that failed to appreciate the complex nature of Hispanic society in the United States and its presence here. But that's a topic, though interesting, is a complex subject meant for another lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kaye. That's been fascinating. It touched on so many different aspects and many complex issues. And and uh, and this the, the the question of perception and the question of producing an image, which is so so complex and it touches on different fields. So let, let me invite questions from the first from our in-person audience, and I would also like to invite our Zoom audience to. Should to, I get that nasty image of this? Yeah, so, so you know what? Questions, <laughs> yeah. Let me just ask, Joseph, should we use the microphone for the questions? Uh, it should be able to, if as long as you speak, speak up, pretty normally, yeah, it'll, it'll be able to capture the voices. Yes, Zoom and I see what I did. I, I gave you, the, <laughs> when, I, when, when I changed, at the last minute, I, 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 I used the wrong version. <laughs> oh, no worries. So, so this was an extraordinary uh, lecture, yes. I have to say. And uh, I'm struck that this story has not been told before, I have to say. Uh, it is interesting, too. Uh, your book is a document of, of the oblivion of such a story and now how it's being recovered. Being in Boston, I cannot uh, but uh, remember that there are important monuments here, not only in the Isabella Gardner uh, Museum uh, of this Spanish race. Trinity Church, uh, yes. for example, uh, the building, the most prominent, uh, maybe historicist building in Boston, it is a copy of the old Cathedral of Flamanca. Uh, right. And Richardson, who also built many buildings here on campus, had never been uh, to, uh, to Spain, only traveled right. afterwards to visit Salamanca and see what did it look like, the building he had copied before uh, here, right? But just across the, the, the square, um, insurgents, uh, uh, paintings in the in the library uh, 
you see uh, when you walk yes. up the staircase a wonderful Dolorosa uh, yes. with all the candles, just like if you were in Seville. And of course, right. Sargent uh, uh, had been to Seville many times and had a large collection of postcards that he had uh, bought in, in, in Spain. And I read once, I don't know if, if I'm, uh, uh, this is completely correct, but before, in the, in the original planning of those paintings in the, in the library, his original plan was to devote those paintings to the history of Spanish literature, to the great deeds of Spanish literature. So just in uh, you know, opposite sides of the main square in, in, in Boston, there's this, this uh, monument. And you have shown too that how the Spanish craze uh, conquered the heart of the, of, of, of the country, Washington DC. Uh, with these paintings. But at the same time, I cannot uh, fail to uh, ask myself whether this, there is a geography of this Spanish craze in the United States, yes. right? Uh, which there was some things they were saying, but I would like if you could comment further. So thinking that you're now currently working on a, on a book on, on, on Henry Charles Lee, uh, <laughs> his radical objection, I mean, of uh, Spanish Catholicism as a symbol of uh, superstition and barbarism, uh, uh, on the upper, on, on the on the uh, on, on the dark side of that perception, but also the other more uh, luminous side, which would be the language, right? Uh, so, builds buildings such as this Giralda kind of buildings being placed in the communities where there was maybe a large community of Spanish-speaking people. Is it the case? So, could you could you reflect a little bit further on the geography of these uh, right. in the United States, both of the on, on the positive but also the, on, on the negative side, or is it just something that's homogeneous? No, it's not. I mean, <clears throat> let's leave the Richardson buildings aside, or the Guastavino tiles, uh, and the libraries in the Boston Public Library, which I think they're quite magnificent. New England is not a place that's particularly interested in, 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 in it's, it's somewhat resistant. Uh, it's, it's got different origins and a, and a different history. This is not to say that it's starting in the 1890s, Harvard and Yale, and all the other universities picked up and would, would establish permanent positions or, 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 or in Spanish literature. Harvard was teaching Spanish literature and, and language since the 1820s, but with, after, after Tickner's retirement, it, it kind of faded away for about 40 years. It was language instruction. Longfellow never really taught much literature. He taught Spanish literature. He taught more Dante than anything else. Mm -hmm. His successors, Lowell, for example, didn't teach any Spanish, he didn't know Spanish, mm -hmm. but that's okay. But so this is, New England is not a place that I would put really a, 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 a pulsating heart of, of, mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the Spanish craze compared to the American Southwest. And legitimately, it was those parts of the country, Florida and, and across the, the Southern United States that had a, either proximity to Latin American cultures or could claim some Spanishness in their oh. past, that's where it, 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 that's the, where the geography of the Spanish crisis is truly located. But it also shows up in, in cities like Chicago, New York, Washington, D.C., for reasons we just explained, across the country. And in a sense, it's, it's surprising how widespread it is, mm -hmm. even in those areas of the country that have no particular Spanish background. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm not saying that it's equally felt. Now, I, I, I don't. I, I can't do the distribution. Yeah. I don't know where these books are being read and who's buying them. Mm -hmm. But I do know Stoddard's lectures, yeah. well attended in the 1880s. He didn't lecture exclusively on Spain. He talked about Russia and Italy as well. But his lectures were well received wherever he went, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, New York, and the like. Uh, he, he travels mostly in, in the Northeast. He's not in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, there, there is a, there's a kind of a, a, a somewhat, there is some bifurcation there. But the interesting thing about Lee, if I could come yeah. back to him, it's not, it's not Spanish cast. He doesn't like Catholicism in general. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and, and when it comes to Spain, he says he never really liked Spanish history. He had no calling for it. But the interesting thing, he didn't blame, the, he, he, he saw that he, he didn't see any weakness in the Spanish character. Mm -hmm. He wasn't part of the race thinking of the era. He attributes Spain's problems in terms of economic development, uh, or what he saw, arrested economic development, its loss in the war of 1898 to the long arm of the church and the Inquisition. The, the Spanish people are fine. It's, it's, a very, it's quite different in many respects than many other, many others of the Spanish critics 
in the 1890s who were, who were using the black legend against it, said that you know, they, they had to lose. He says, there's nothing wrong with the Spain people. But the problem is the, the Roman Catholic Church. He's got his own problem with that institution. And he's more, he, he, he's, by the way, he's Quaker hair. He's, he's also had, he's, he, there's like, his mother was born Catholic. Ah, okay. <laughs> but she didn't like the Catholic Church either. <laughs> <laughs> something there. Yes. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for a uh, journey uh, to the both sunny and dark sessions of uh, Spanish culture and history in the States. Uh, if you could, could you please comment a bit more about the broad perception also of uh, Francos in, uh, here in the States, because it is true that after, uh, well, during the war, after the war, black legend, so to speak, to a certain extent, uh, uh, resurgence, but after uh, the opening of the uh, naval base. Uh, 1953. Uh, publications started uh, critiquing, let's say, lighter uh, shade of dark history that Francoism was acquired in the States because it was the bulwark against communism for many uh, Americans. And someone like Herbert Matthews, the journalist who wrote and published uh, The Yoke and the Arrow in 57, where right. actually critiqued that uh, perception in the US of Francoism as, you know, uh, uh, bulwark against communism. And he actually defended on, on very romantic terms the true uh, uh, Spain that should be defended, not the Franco Spain, but the Republican Spain uh, that needed to be reclaimed uh, from his new image of Francoism. Um, I think Matthews, <laughs> for all of his, his romanticized image, of, his oh, embrace of that, I think he stands apart. I don't. I'm, I'm no, no expert in in, in 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 American political writing or the writings of American political scientists or, or newspapers of, of Spain of the 50s and 60s. But I think he he's he 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 he's at one end of the spectrum. What I basically when I think about Franco Spain, I thought basically thinking of when I was a kid and going to college in, in, in New York, Spain had no purchase outside of the Casa Hispanica. Colombia. Casa Hispanica was created by a man from Oviedo, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, Onis, Federico, basically. It was placed, it was where language was taught, but it was also where history, Spanish history was taught, con cultural civilization. It was taught there because the historian history department wouldn't touch it. And that what was true of Colombia, you could go nationwide with one or two exceptions. There were no Spanish historians by the 1950s because the, the, the perception was that there's nothing to study after the Middle Ages. And why can't I think of the man who's, who, who, oh, Roger Bigelow, Mer Mer now I got it. Roger Bigelow Meredith. Mer Mer he was hired at Harvard in 1906, taught the history of the Spanish Middle Ages here for 50 years, taught 16th and 17th century history, he, he retires and it, basically Franco just established his regime. Harvard wouldn't touch him. I, I haven't read the I haven't read the memos of the history department. I probably will never will. I would like somebody to know that why he, he was the leading historian of Spain in the United States, and he, he disappears. And that's what happened at, at Harvard. Happened at other places across the United States. It was it was a place that you would go if you want to learn about Spain. You had to go to literature or go to Spain itself. It's not it was, it was not it was, and I can go on and on about various people who say why would you study Spain? This is when I started studying in 1965. You would they look at you as if you were crazy. I had professors at Princeton and. And, and Cambridge, too. You would go there. It's filled with fascists. <laughs> I, well, it, it, there are plenty of fascists, but there are other people too. And they have another history. And, and, and in a sense, it, it, there was an, you, you, you were beginning to think of Spain as somewhat different or somewhat apart from 
the, the, the Frank regime, and that's in a sense that's what gradually bring the, bring it back to the to 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 back up to uh, bring renew interest in in, 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 the, in the history of of the country. Thanks in part to my former teacher, John Elliott, who died in February. He went there in 1953 for the first time. Once again, an, an exception rather than the rule. Uh, I, I, I don't think there was a, a groundswell of, of, of support for the Franklin Museum outside certain political circles in, 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 in the United States and outside the Spanish military. It wasn't that they were interested in Franco per se, but, but as you said, uh, it was a bulwark against communism. And that's exactly why Eisenhower and Dulles opened the door to Spain after 10 years of isolation. Yeah, it's like two sides to a, 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 a complex phenomenon. From yes. The late 50s and early 60s. Uh, one uh, side to that phenomenon is Francoism. The other side is uh, the true Spanish culture, which is romanticized by Harry Matthews, and by someone who's uh, very close to him, to him, that is Hemingway. Sure. Uh, very close. And uh, Hemingway's uh, publications, both in English and in Spanish, and also the film adaptations, I start to gain certain curves. So in terms of yes. uh, culture, and even Republican culture, which is what Harry Matthews was actually talking about, uh, there might not be a groundswell, but it's uh, in the early 60s, uh, maybe, you know, the early glimpses of a certain different perception about the other Spain, which has been somehow, uh, you know, hidden away under the Franco regime. That, that's Okay, that I don't think. I saw you had a slide in Chicago, the, um, the Columbian Exposition. Yes, yeah, yeah, that, that's a... <laughs> I didn't have time to get into it. Um, but um, have you come across the Queen Isabella Association? Yes. Uh, well, the the the, the, the 1893 uh, World Columbian Exhibition. Um, because also, I'm sorry to interrupt you because you also had the uh, image of the statue that they commissioned. Yes, of, who's uh, Queen Isabel. Uh, which was which, which they, and it didn't, it, it's it's in plaster because they didn't have the money to put her in bronze. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a Queen Isabella quarter as well. Uh, Betty Palmer uh, of the Women's Association, she was partly responsible uh, for, uh, for, for help, help promoting the, the Spanish theme of the, of the World's Columbian Exhibition, helping to get the replicas of the, of the Nina C Pinto and the Santa Maria, the Spaniards built them, they, they brought them to Chicago, they sailed them in, they built a replica of La Rabida, the monastery in, in, in southern Spain where Columbus supposedly dreamed up the, the idea of going to the new world. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, it was, well, I think it was partly Guastavino. I think he was the architect. Built a replica of the Span of the Valencian um, lonja uh, to serve as Spain's national pavilion. There, uh, it was built in also 1893. It wasn't a great success compared to the compared to to, to the to the to the ships and to and to the to the artifacts of Columbus, which most people wanted to see. Um, the Queen Isabella, which, there was a big dispute about Queen Isabella by, uh, 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 by I think it was Palmer, she thought she was too Catholic for the, no, for, for the not, exhibition. No, I'm Maybe. But, but she uh, wasn't a member of the Queen Isabella Association. No, was, she wasn't. Right. No, the queen, she, uh, she sidelined the Queen Isabella right. Association. That was, and uh, showed up in the agricultural pavil to, pavilion rather than something else. Trying to organize women's uh, organizations right. all over the country. Right. So she actually, Palmer actually sidelined them. And that's why they lost funding. And that's why the statue. Uh, designed by Harriet Hosmer. That's right. Uh, thank Harriet you. Harriet Goodhue Hosmer. So I, 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 I remembered it when you put up the slide of the House of Blue. Right. No, um, no. And there, there was <laughs> the, the, there was a battle royal between the Queen of Business Association and, and, and Miss Palmer. And not only between the, that association and Miss Palmer, but Miss Palmer and, and the Infanta. Uh, what, uh, what's her name? Not Christina. Yeah, 
uh, Infante, the first Spanish member of the royal house to come to Spain, and she did not get on with Betsy Palmer, uh, and, and that was a disaster. And, and and when she left town, everybody was happy. She smoked too much for them too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, that I was surprised you said that uh, Lowell uh, didn't know Spanish very well because he was ambassador. He was yeah, but he, ambassador. he took lessons when he got there. No. Not the precedence for that. He was a great admirer and defender of using particular dealers. Yes, he was. Not, and he was well respected in Spain. But when he got there, he didn't, I mean, he, 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 he didn't know anything about Spain. He wanted to learn something about Spain. Mm -hmm. And Actually, they um, they suggest at Harvard they suggested they um, they asked William Dean House if he wanted to chair, and House uh, rejected it. There's, a, 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 I think, if I'm not sure it was Lowell's immediate successor, but there's a man named Jabez Curry who was a, an American ambassador there in the '80s and, 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 and who who knew Spanish, and and, and he, who wrote about the Spanish government much more so than Lowell did. Very interesting guy. Mm -hmm. I think there's a question from Spanish. Uh, yes, uh, well, Professor Garrett, thank you for a, for a beautiful lecture and, and uh, also for the book. Uh, I think as uh, Professor Pereira was, was saying, is a, is a fast read. And what, what I found really uh, fascinating about the, the story that you tell is that we are not looking at a phenomenon that affects the upper class, the, the collectors, or uh, the, the, the rich people that would build their houses in the Spanish style. Uh, at the moment, it, it affects popular culture with the cinema, it affects business in certain areas of the US, I mean, you were mentioning tourism. The chambers of commerce are the ones that are saying, okay, as I said, this happens in Santa Barbara, after a, 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 an earthquake. The, the new mm -hmm. style, we're going to be the Spanish style because this is good for business. Right. And, and I'm finding fascinated that it touched so many areas of, of American life. Uh, it make you, you have some. Explanation for that because we, we, you know, we <laughs> that's why I think it's the Americanness of it. That, that I mean, it's I think I mean it's the autochthonous quality of it. It's seen how it's not a French import. It's 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 it, it is it it has it has just to use a kind of commonplace metaphor. It has roots in this country, which could be established. In, the, in, in California, you could see it in the missions, above all in the missions. And that's part of it. And of course, those missions are 18th century and they're Franciscans and they have their own history. But they, they, they can push it back further to earlier expir expirations. And they can push it back in a, with a romanticized vision of Santa Fe, for example, forgetting about the barbarities of, of Juan de Iñate. But, it, but it, it, it's very interesting. And Santa Fe is a place I, it, it's particularly interesting because the Casa de Corregidor, which is the, right there on the square, and it's in the book that was anglicized with kind of little, little balconies in the, in the 1860s to make it more American. But by the 1890s, 1910, they said, no, let, let's make it Spanish because that's more like us. And so they, they take it, they put it back to a, more or less it's, a, it's an original Dolby in the sense to show that it says it was always here this way. It's part of our culture. Now, they're, 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 they're ignoring, of course, the, the Mexican aspect of it. But you have to remember that there are whole classes in, 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 in New Mexico of certain, let's say, political classes, wealthy ranchers, who I, since the mid 19th century identify as Spanish to separate themselves from the obreros in, in, in working in the fields. In the sense, they take pride in their purity of blood. They're pretending that they're the, they're the sons and the, and the daughters of, of, of the original Spanish conquistadors of the 16th century. They, in a sense, we're Spanish as opposed to these other characters who, who, who are working in the fields. And it's very interesting if I wanted to go on about the defend, the fight in Santa Fe about this Juan de Nate statue in 2020, mm -hmm. the man who was defending against indigenous groups that were attacking the statue, his name was Vaca. 
in a sense, these, these splits, and I'm no expert in the, in the Mexican society, but the fact you have splits, you have divisions in New Mexico and throughout the Southwest and other parts of the country between people who think themselves as Spanish, partly on, on, on class grounds, partly on, on phenotypical grounds, uh, and, and, and perhaps on linguistic grounds as well. And so you there's there's a, Spain always had its defenders in this in this region, mm -hmm. and 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 in California the great supporters of Spain were the descendants of the rich the wealthy Californios the wealthy landowners and I think that's really behind what's taking place in in in, in places like Santa Barbara San Diego Los Angeles mm -hmm. uh, and, and the like. Uh, and in a sense, they're, put, they're putting a dip, they're, they're, they're standing back from Mexico, per se. And, and in a sense, this has been a, and that's a point of contention in, 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 in California. It was criticized then by some, but particularly starting in the 1950s by a critic by the name of Terry McWilliams. Thank you. I think there's a question from yeah, the, so from the Cuban Stephen and Warfin has written more of an observation than a question. The teaching of the history of the Spanish language as an academic subject goes back to the late 19th century at Harvard, with the work and teaching of Jeremiah and Boyd. Right. He wrote a dissertation circa 1898 on the history of the old Spanish civilization. Right. At this time, some Spanish students began to edit the English Spanish texts. All these scholars were at East Coast universities. And then follows up with one other thought the increase in interest in studying Spanish as a foreign language seems to overlap. And hostility towards the German language as a result of the World War. Right, he's right. <laughs> There's two things going on. One is Pan Americanism. A little bit more, and thank you for that comment. Um, the interest in it, it's linked to Spanish Americanisms and the and, and, and Pan American movement and the opening of the Spanish Canal. Well, excuse me, the, Pan, uh, the uh, Panama Canal in 1914, which opens up a whole new, seemingly opens up for Americans a huge new market. And, and individuals like Huntington, who has this kind of rather literary view of Spain, said, oh, they're only interested in commercial Spanish. They're not really interested in, 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 in Spain and its culture. I mean, he, he kind of poo-pooed this stuff. He didn't, he didn't like that the, kind of the mercantile interest in, in, Spanish, in, in Spanish languages. He wanted to, to focus more on El Cid and, and Cervantes, and I can understand that. But in a sense, there's a groundswell that, that, that develops just about the time, same time of the war as the interest in German di di disappears because of, because of World War I. And you can, see, if you, you look at the matriculations in, in, in places like Columbia where they're, they're published, boom, they just skyrocket. And the teachers are French and German, not at Harvard per se, but at other universities saying, well, why should we study Spanish? What's wrong? Why should we, why not Choctaw? Why not indigenous language? What does that culture have us to offer? Because the, the, there was there was this the the, the 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 lingering enlightenment perception, I think Voltaire or Condorcet or or Diderot, that saying that this country has nothing to contribute to Western civilization. And it was in the sense that it was there. It, I'm not. I'm not sure that everyone who studied Spanish language in in, in in the 1920s understood much about Spain. But there was there was there was a growing groundswell of interest in that in, in in the language, partly probably because they thought more about Mexico than Spain. But it didn't hurt Spanish culture either. And that's the moment when the Casa Hispanica is is created in in New York City and other in, in other institutions across the United States. 1890s, 1910s is when really the, the roots of, of Spanish language and literature put, are, are solid in the United States, are really put down solidly in the United States in, in universities like Harvard, Yale, and the like. I'd like to ask, I've once heard that the writer, the Spanish writer, 20th century Spanish writer, with the largest number of translations into English is Blasco Ibani. I, I haven't checked this. Fact, but I think it's it's true, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so I think it is a very good example of how the perception of a country's literature, art, etc., in another country uh, may be very different from the from its perception in the in in the original country. Like because I don't think if any I mean, most of us would not answer to the question 
who do you think is the Spanish writer with the largest number of English translations? I don't think that's what would, Ivanian would be the first writer that we, we, we would quote, we would mention. Uh, however, uh, so, so that's probably due to reasons pertaining to the situation, the, the concept of Spain in, in, in the US then. Uh, so I think it's a good example of how, how uh, the perception varies in every country. Right. And just art and culture in general. Well, and, and I didn't think that many people reading Vasco of Banyas and States knew much about his, his problems with Alfonso the 13th and the monarchy either. I think they, the, 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 the political aspect of his career is, is something that was basically far to them. In a sense, it's, 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 it, it's the subject matter that they're interested in, particularly <laughs> anything associated with the bull ring helps. Anything associated with, with, with gypsies helps. Anything associated with Carmen-like figures helped. And it's, Carmen really takes off uh, in, in, in 1880s and 1890s in this country. <laughs> As, that's the moment when flamenco, there, it was here before, but it was with, with figures like La Carmencita, painted both by uh, Chase and by, uh, and by, uh, by uh, Sargent. She's, she's a, a rock star in New York and, and, and across the country. Forms everywhere, and she has her own fashion line as well. There's another a kind of earlier Spanish space praise for Spanish uh, fashion in the 1890s that was nurtured by her and her love. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Anybody wants to ask? Yeah, I would like to go back to your mentioning of uh, New Mexico, Santa Fe in particular. I remember about 27 years ago. Uh, I, there was a conference of Spaniards, Spaniard uh, professors teaching throughout the United States, but we all met in, in Santa Fe. And it was amazing to see a lady, an indigenous lady in the street who overheard the, us talking in Spanish. And she, she was Native American and she stopped us. And she was so happy to meet us and to talk to us. And she, so we spoke for about 10 minutes with her. She identified completely with Spain. She, she called it La Madre Patria, you know, which was an amazing thing. So there is, there are American, American people, Native Americans who identify with being Spaniard and proud, she was proud and, and happy to, to talk to us. Well, my, if you want to go back to the world of the movies, and in my, in my youth, there was, there was a guy called the Long Ranger, and he had an Indian sidekick. What was his name? Of course, Tonto. Oh, no. Did I know what Tonto meant <laughs> in, in 1950? No, it's stupid. Fool. And what did he say? He said, he called him Kino Sabe. It's basically said Kien no Sabe. Who doesn't know? So basically, in the sense, without knowing it, the, that's the, 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 that serial on TV, The Long Ranger, there was a tonto who knew Spanish. In the sense, they're Spanish speakers. And to a certain degree, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert in, 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 the, in the indigenous cultures in the Southwest, but Spanish provided a kind of a lingua franca. For, for many, for different linguistic, different groups speaking different languages, but because of slavery and because of trade and, 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 and ties to Mexico, it becomes a kind, it becomes a, ver, a, a vernacular, even if it's spoken poorly. So therefore that identification does not surprise me. Thank you very much, Professor. Mm -hmm. I think we can now give it a few.